Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Kelly from HKIC So office. And good morning to those of you joining us from the Western part um, of the globe. I welcome you to 2020 Seoul ADR Festival Week HKIC webinar on experts' insight on key concerns of a virtual hearing. Um, as we near the end of 2020, uh, I feel like back on this bizarre year we faced and overcome. I am sure this year will go down in history as a year to remember. And I think the international arbitration field is no different. Um, with COVID-19 pandemic, we had to face, we had faced a challenge and ad had to adapt to new methods of um, working with our clients, um, users, and also how we conduct hearings. Virtual hearings has been a great alternative method and in some cases, the only viable option we have available with no exact end to COVID-19 situation in sight. So it's, it is a great platform and uh, many um, renovated and how we conduct hearings are going forward, but this does not come without any concerns or challenges. So today we will address just that. We are honored to have um, our industry experts here today to discuss what we have seen so far um, and the key and to address the three key concerns that we have seen with um, virtual hearings. So the first issue that we're going to deal with is how we cross-examine a witness uh, in a witness during virtual hearings. And the second is how we present evidence on an online platform and also how uh, simultaneous interpretation uh, is conducted in a virtual hearing setting. So this webinar will be a unique experience for you, hopefully, as um, our experts will not only explain to you these important issues, but also provide a live demonstration on the uh, evidence presentation and um, SI. So we can first um, hand experience a glimpse of how an actual virtual hearing is played out. So please stay tuned. Um, during the webinar, please feel free to share any questions you may have uh, in the Q&A box uh, you see below. Um, and we will address these um, questions at the end of the session. Um, now, let me give you a brief introduction of our speakers for now and would we'll provide a more detailed introduction later before their session begins. First, um, we are honored to have Professor Shin Hee Tech uh, provide the welcome remarks for this uh, event. Professor Shin is the chairman of KCAB International. He also serves as the governing board member of ICCA. He recently retired from Seoul uh, National University School of Law, where he taught international business transactions and resolution of commercial and investor state disputes arising from cross-border transactions for over a decade. He also has private practice experience at a top Korean law firm, Kim and Chang. So he comes with a wide range of um, expertise and he regularly sits as arbitrator for our institution, HKIC, AAA, uh, ICSIB, KCAB, and SEAC. He is a member of International Commercial Experts Committee of the Supreme People Court of China. And he is also on the International Advisory Board of Vienna International Arbitration Center. Well, the list goes on, uh, but for sake of time, I will stop here and turn it over to Professor Shin himself. Professor Shin, um, thank you for um, taking out an important part of your time to provide this welcome remarks. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, do you, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. Uh, as I don't see my, my picture, uh, my video. Uh, you look great as well. Okay, okay, then I will, I will start. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the HKIAC webinar today as one of the major events of Seoul ADR Festival 2020. First of all, I would like to extend my special thanks to our dear friends, Sarah Grimmer, Eric Ng, and Kelly Lee E of HKIAC for participating again this year in Seoul ADR Festival 2020. 
KCAB and HKIAC have a long tradition of participating in arbitration week events organized by each other. Last month, KCAB organized its webinar in Hong Kong Arbitration Week hosted by HKIAC. I would also like to extend my appreciation to our distinguished panel of speakers who have graciously shared their time and expertise with us for today's webinar. It is a very rare opportunity to hear insights from the key supporters of international arbitration hearings, interpreters and transcribers from TransPerfect and EPIC. Before the outbreak of COVID-19, the arbitration community had generally thought that hearings could only be conducted in person except for a preliminary hearing dealing with mundane procedural issues. Facing strict lockdowns, social distancing, and travel restrictions, international arbitration community has no other choice but to adopt home-based working and to transform case management services, arbitration procedures, and evidentiary hearings into either hybrid or fully virtual mode. Surprisingly, many in the arbitration community, including myself, now realize that even the full-scale hearings could be conducted virtually. It is an awakening experience. However, there could be many practical difficulties in conducting full-scale hearings virtually, unless all the practical aspect of hearings are properly addressed in advance. The virtual hearings would be destined to be a source of frustration. Today, you will be relieved to hear that those involved in the arbitration hearings, such as arbitral institutions, arbitrators, counselors, transcribers, and interpreters all have been endeavoring to ensure that the virtual hearings could be conducted seamlessly by working out ways to overcome perceived and real difficulties which could arise in the course of virtual hearings. In this sense, I am sure that you will find today's webinar very useful, informative, and rewarding. Again, I appreciated HKIAC's goodwill to present this very timely and meaningful webinar as a part of Seoul ADR Festival events. I wish that all of you and your families stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shen, for your warm welcome and your thoughtful insight. Um, <coughs> now I move on to our very own Eric, our managing counsel. Eric has worked for several years as a barrister in Hong Kong at counsel and also as a tribunal secretary. He also has technical background and <coughs> excuse me, an ex experience and has been a tremendous asset to HKIAC, particularly in this current climate. And he is our, uh, our leader in IT and virtual hearing facilities. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, I'm not sure all of that was deserved, but <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes to basically go over um, some of the basics of the virtual hearing. Uh, I'm sure at this point in 2020, most of the attendees uh, will have participated either in a partial or fully virtual hearing. But for those of you who have yet to experience that opportunity, um, I'm going to spend a couple minutes just to talk about the uh, basics of a virtual hearing, what it is and, and what it can, um, comprises of, and then talk a little bit about HKIC's experience with virtual hearings, particularly in 2020, as well as any tips and uh, guidance that HKIC provides in relation to virtual hearings. So if we can go first to what is a virtual hearing? 
Uh, it is essentially a method of supplementing or augmenting uh, what you would normally see in a physical hearing room. It allows those who cannot attend uh, or cannot be in the physical hearing room to have all of the functions and functionality that a, a physical hearing would have. And this includes the ability to talk and see the arbitrators, uh, see the counsel, uh, examine witnesses, being able to look at evidence and being able to have access to a full transcript. So if we look at some of the elements of a virtual hearing, uh, we look at, when we look at the elements, we're usually looking at three different components, uh, what we call the video conferencing or the telepresence solution, similar to what you're seeing uh, right now on Zoom, uh, the electronic presentation of evidence, which allows for a simultaneous display of documentary evidence to all of the participants. Um, similar, very similar, in fact, to the presentation that you're seeing right now on this webinar. And thirdly, uh, access to real-time transcription and remote transcription, regardless of where the participants may be in their hearing. Uh, proceeding to the first element, which is the video conferencing solution. Now, video conferencing, we usually classify into two categories of video conferencing, what we call IP-based solutions, which tend to be the historical uh, solutions that we have for vir uh, virtual hearings. And you, you would usually find these solutions available at most major hearing centers or uh, at major law firms. But with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have found that sometimes people don't have access or ready access to IP-based solutions. And so the majority of our virtual hearings these days in 2020 comprise of what we call cloud-based solutions. Now, these solutions are usually found on platforms such as Zoom or also such as WebEx or Microsoft Teams or BlueJeans. Now, these cloud-based solutions allow participants to attend uh, much in, in a much easier manner. And in fact, in many of our virtual hearings, we've had to use cloud-based solutions because either due to governmental restrictions or access to facilities, parties or counsel or witnesses have had to attend from home. And attending from home for a cloud-based solution tends to be much simpler and much more effective. Proceeding to the second component of uh, virtual hearings, what we usually call the electronic presentation of evidence or in shorthand, EPE. Now the electronic presentation of evidence allows for parties to literally be on the same page. Uh, using some sort of shared screen functionality, which we find uh, built into many uh, cloud-based platforms, or in relation to uh, IP-based solutions, the EPE system allows councils to direct the uh, arbitrators and the witnesses' attention to specific exhibits or evidence which is provided in the bundle. Uh, there's another slide after this, which actually goes into some of uh, the, the bits of the EPE for your reference. Now, the EPE system is usually managed by a third party. Uh, the third party will have access to the document bundles and it allows for a neutral party to be in control of the evidence and the evidence presentation. Uh, however, in certain cases, we have also seen that the evidence can be controlled by the parties themselves. Now, we usually do this when there are complex factual exhibits in play. Uh, for example, in construction arbitrator arbitrations, uh, many of the exhibits tend to be architectural drawings or blueprints. Uh, those require council expertise or experts uh, expertise in navigating. And in those cases, we do allow for parties to control the evidence themselves. But for the majority of your cases, uh, you will usually have a third party um, pro provided by the service provider who will be on, in charge of directing your evidence. The third component, uh, which is quite important in international arbitrations, is real-time remote transcription. Now, traditionally, the court reporter or the transcriber would be in the same room as the parties and would have direct access to uh, the, the hearing itself. But with the advent of COVID-19 uh, and the need for virtual hearings, those court reporters can now be present in any location, including from home. And we, in fact, have had many virtual hearings where the court reporter was, in, was not in the same location as any of the parties and was participating fully remotely, and yet was still able to provide a full real-time transcription uh, program for the parties and the arbitrators. Remote access to the transcription system also allows the parties and arbitrators to keep track of their proceedings just as if they were in the same room, including the ability to make annotations and notes, just like if they were in a physical hearing. Now, that was a very brief overview of what the components of a virtual hearing is. 
So maybe it's now better to talk about what HKIC's experience has been with virtual hearings. And the experience in some has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, in almost all of our cases, we see that users are choosing to proceed with virtual hearings rather than postponing. Even during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, what we noticed was that parties were choosing to uh, use virtual solutions rather than postpone their hearings to an unspecified and indeterminate date. Uh, particularly given the nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, those, even those hearings which were postponed eventually did wind up using virtual hearings because it became unclear, even at this date, whether or not global travel restrictions would ease over time. As you can see in the second column, the, our experience with uh, virtual hearings has been also significant and numerous. 65% of all of our hearings to date have been either partially or fully virtual in nature. Now, when we say partially virtual, we mean that uh, either some of the parties or some of the arbitrators are able to gather either at the HKIAC or another remote location, with only some of the witnesses or councils participating remotely. However, we have also administered fully virtual hearings where uh, no party was in fact in the same location and no party was at HKIAC. Those hearings spanned everything from case management conferences all the way up to full merit hearings. So we can see that virtual hearings has been successful to date with HKIAC. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in April and May, 85% of all of HKIC's hearings were either partially or fully virtual in nature. And we don't see this uh, trend stopping in 2021. 60% of all of our future bookings uh, will be either partially or fully virtual in nature. And so we see virtual hearings not as a stopgap measure uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, but rather something which will be trending uh, and will become a permanent fixture in the future of international arbitration. Again, as we stated, these hearings can span from anything from simple case management conferences to short uh, emergency arbitrator procedures to full merits hearings and 40 plus or 50 plus day cases. Uh, we have had several cases which have spanned two to three weeks in length. And although they do require a lot of planning, uh, they have been overwhelmingly successful. HKIC has administered most of these cases through its own, uh, uh, on its own arbitrations or HKIC's administered arbitrations. However, given the global nature of the pandemic and the, the fact that travel restrictions are not limited to Hong Kong, we have also seen parties and councils and arbitrators who are participating in other institutional cases, such as through ICC, SIAC, or ad hoc cases, utilize HKIC's uh, virtual hearing services to help administer a fully virtual hearing. We've also administered uh, and assisted on court proceedings in assisting uh, for witnesses ex examination, uh, both factual and expert for court proceedings in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and in Canada. Now, in terms of our tips and tricks, things that you should take away uh, from a virtual hearing, our paramount uh, concern is communication. And as I'm sure uh, Mr. Ware will go into in more detail during his presentation, uh, this is not an arms race. Uh, communication between the parties is paramount to ensure that a virtual hearing is successful. And we ask that the parties contact the administering institution for the virtual hearing, such as HKIAC, as early as possible in advance of a potential virtual hearing. This allows for us to get a better idea of what the party's requirements are um, and help guide the parties both in terms of what they need to set up as well as uh, organizing test sessions to ensure that the parties and the council and the arbitrators are uh, easily seen, easily heard, and that we can address any issues well in advance of the actual hearing. We will arrange testing sessions with the parties uh, in advance of the hearing dates to ensure that the technologies which have been chosen, whether that be IP-based or uh, cloud-based solutions and any of the services that we are providing are working well with the parties and that there are no sort of technical glitches. Now, if there are technical glitches, uh, we also encourage the parties to plan backup options. Uh, it may be easy enough for the parties to agree, for example, to use Zoom for a virtual hearing. But in the event that a party cannot access Zoom or is having issues, uh, HKIC always encourages and provides uh, advice in relation to backup solutions. 
either in relation to what we call platform failures in relation to the failure of say uh, a single uh, cloud-based video conferencing service or internet failures if a party is simply unable to connect to the internet. And those usually consist of uh, telephonic or uh, teleconference solutions available to the parties. The key uh, piece of advice here is that although virtual hearings can be and are successful, they do require a little bit more planning than, uh, in, than a physical hearing. And so we encourage parties who are planning on a virtual hearing to get in touch with us as early as possible so that we can help guide them through that process. Part of that guidance is uh, constituted in what we have as our guidelines for virtual hearings. Now, these were released in 14 of May, 2020. And these guidelines collate HKIC's experience with virtual hearings into a practical document for parties and tribunals who may be considering a virtual hearing. This addresses many of the common questions that are raised by parties and arbitrators, both in terms of the availability of witnesses, the ability for witnesses to connect, and concerns and questions as relating to the examination and cross-examination of said witnesses. These guidelines and recommendations are there for the parties to ensure that a virtual hearing proceeds as smoothly as possible. Um, and although the parties, uh, we don't really treat this as a protocol for the parties, these are guidelines and tips which the parties should keep in mind when developing the protocol or when the arbitrators uh, should consider when directing a virtual hearing. Thank you again for all of your uh, time in relation to uh, the virtual hearings. I hope that the pro uh, information that I provided was uh, useful and new to some of the parties. And uh, thank you again to Kelly and uh, the KCAB for inviting me to speak at the uh, ADR Festival in Seoul. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Eric. Um, before I let you go, um, I was wondering if you could also share a brief information on our HKIC's virtual hearing suite that we have recently launched. Um, just briefly well, is fine. Yeah. Um, when the COVID-19 pandemic wa was at its peak in, in around March or April uh, and May of 2020, what we realized was that uh, because this fate was something which looked to become a permanent fixture, uh, we made quick investments into overhauling uh, our hearing rooms to help provide virtual hearing services. Now we have just recently launched our virtual hearing suite uh, in room Kowloon that includes cameras uh, from multiple angles to allow for 360 degree views of the room, larger displays and more, more displays for arbitrators and parties who are participating in Hong Kong to have better access to evidence bundles and uh, closer access to the video conferencing systems so that you aren't looking at, for example, postage stamp sized uh, pictures uh, across a, a large hearing space. Uh, that virtual hearing suite ha was launched in October, uh, sorry, September of 2020. And we have already seen uh, many hearings being taken place uh, in the virtual hearing suite with uh, great success. Uh, and so we are, uh, we, we'd like to uh, ask the parties if you are interested to send us an inquiry and we'd be happy to show off that uh, space to you uh, at a later date. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, we also have a 3D video available on our website. So you can always go ahead and um, um, go to our website and also check out the link. That's correct. Great. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Um, as Eric has explained, um, there has uh, many parties have already experienced uh, virtual hearings. Uh, partially or fully, uh, but there still has been concerns of um, what, how effective cross-examination will be in a virtual hearing setting. So our next di distinguished speaker is Anton Ware, who will discuss <clears throat> discuss dealing with a cross-examination of a witness in a virtual hearing and give practical tips on overcoming certain issues. Anton is a partner at Arnold and Porter Shanghai office. He acts as counsel and advocate in commercial and investor state disputes for private sector companies, uh, sovereign states, as well as government-owned entities. Um, he often represents clients in the APAC region and specifically with disputes involving uh, Chinese counterparty as he speaks and reads Mandarin Chinese, which is um, great <laughs> working in um, the Shanghai office. He serves as an ambassador to, of the ICC Commission on the Belt and Road Initiative. He's listed as an arbitrator for HKIC, KCAB, um, and SCIA. <clears throat> he has been recognized as 
a future leader in the field of international arbitration. And we are happy to have um, you here today, Anton. Um, please feel free to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that very kind introduction. So the, the topic of my presentation today is what's the matter with virtual cross-examination? But let's begin with the good news. And, and that is that virtual cross-examination is not an entirely different or new exercise compared to in-person cross-examination. Virtual cross-examination is still cross-examination. And all of the main elements of an effective cross-examination apply equally to a virtual cross-examination. So I've listed on this slide some of the, the key elements or key tips that I always advocate uh, to achieve an effective cross-examination. For example, before the cross, making sure that you're carefully identifying your objectives, making sure that you are gathering and organizing and mastering the documents that you plan to use in the cross-examination and carefully preparing your question outline. So whether it's in-person or virtual, preparation is more than half the battle when it comes to cross-examination. During the cross-examination, your, one of your objectives is going to be to control the examination, to control the witness, but also to be building a certain degree of trust and rapport with the witness so that the witness will open up and answer your questions. You've also got to be very conscious of managing your time. And another key skill is knowing when to stop. What's the, the pro, avoiding that proverbial one question too many, or also avoiding uh, unnecessary uh, topic areas. All of those factors or elements apply with equal force to a virtual cross-examination. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, if virtual cross-examination is just another form of cross-examination, what's the problem? Why is it that so many lawyers and parties have expressed concerns about virtual cross-examination being uh, in some way an inadequate replacement uh, or, or substitute for in-person uh, cross-examination? And the, the answer is that virtual cross-examination does present some unique challenges. Uh, I'm going to be talking about four of those challenges in my presentation today. There are others, but we have limited time, so I've selected uh, four. But for each one, we'll talk about some potential solutions. So the four that I've identified are the, the, the who's in the room problem, uh, the, the challenge of talking to a box on a screen, uh, the challenge of getting the documents in front of the witness, and then IT issues at the witness site. So if we could go to the next slide, please. The who's in the room problem. And, and the, the, the problem here is a concern that because the witness is going to be looking at a screen throughout the entire cross-examination, is there a possibility that, that the witness uh, might be receiving assistance or, or input, uh, in other words, being coached during the cross-examination, for example, uh, through email or uh, instant message coming across on, on the screen during the cross-examination. I think that's a concern that has been broadly identified, at least in, in, in theory, as a theoretical concern. As for how, how much of a, a, a problem it is in reality, I think that's more of a question mark. Personally, I'm, I'm not aware of any instances in which uh, a witness has been found to have been, been uh, being coached in, in this way. And I think it's actually quite unlikely given the uh, you know, professional nature of counsel that are involved in these cases. But nevertheless, it's a concern. So what is the solution? What I've, what I've identified on the, on the screen is what I, what I call the trust but verify solution. So what do I mean by that? In the, in the trust category, uh, we, we, we want to, it, it's somewhat of an honor system. So we are, we are going to be trusting that the witness is going to be complying with his or her declaration to tell the truth. I think it's also a good best practice for a virtual cross-examination to have the witness make an additional declaration that uh, he, that during the cross-examination, he will not be accessing any other materials 
other than the documents that are going to be displayed on the screen or that have been put in front of him uh, for, specifically for the purpose of the cross-examination. So that's, that's on the part of the, the witness. I think that it can also be useful to have the tribunal give an express admonition in the procedural order for the hearing reminding both counsel and the parties that it is impermissible for, uh, for, for anyone to be communicating with the witness during their examination by any means other than the, the communication that is taking place on the record. So that should be very clear and agreed in the protocol for the hearing. Now, if that's not enough, you still you want to take some steps to 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 verify that there's compliance with those declarations. One option, probably the ideal option, is to have a, an in-person observer in the room with the witness. That's the 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 best practice solution if it's if it's possible if it's practical under the circumstances of course as eric and others have have mentioned that during we are in a pandemic and for many people for many participants in the hearing it may not be uh, feasible or may not be advisable to have additional people uh, joining in in the room together with the witness so if that is if if that's not possible, then another option is to use technology to try to accomplish the same thing. Uh, we've seen in some hearings, witnesses being asked to, to take their webcam and turn it 360 degrees at least once at the outset of the examination and then potentially again periodically after breaks and so forth just to to show everyone that there's no one else in the room that you know to show the screen that there's nothing else on the screen other than the the hearing materials and that there's nothing else on the table other than the hearing materials so that's one option if that still doesn't give you enough comfort you can use what i've uh, described as a nanny cam and the idea there would be to position a laptop with a camera behind the witness or next to the witness so that it is it is focusing on the witness's screen uh, and you could actually have that laptop join to the to the zoom uh, conference so that everyone is is viewing as a video participant the witness's screen and you can be quite sure that nothing is happening on the screen that shouldn't be happening i've never had to use that but you know it's an option in case this is something that uh, is an acute concern for you so let's go to the next slide and this is the, the talking to a box on a screen problem, the, the problem that all of us are experiencing right now as we go through this, this webinar. And, and in a nutshell, the issue here is that something is lost when you go from the in-person setting to the virtual or remote setting. There's a loss of immediacy and intimacy. There's a loss of that human element which it can, can make it more difficult for the examiner to build, to sort of get into a nice rhythm and build a rapport with the witness. Uh, it can also make it more difficult for the examiner to main, maintain control of the examination and to effectively interrupt in the rare cases when it's necessary to do that. It also, from the flip side perspective of the, the party that's presenting the witness can make it more difficult for the witness to develop that same rapport with the tribunal, which is ultimately what you hope to be achieving through your witness testimony. You want to be establishing the witness's credibility for uh, in front of the tribunal. All of those things are a bit more difficult when you're not in person, you're not really able to look the witness in the eye, and instead you're looking at a box on a screen. So what are the solutions here? Uh, once, one solution, I think, is to make the best use of the technology that is available. So try to make sure that technology is working for you and not against you in terms of the objective of, of maintaining that human element of the witness examination. And essentially, the better your technological setup, the, the, the better you're going to be able to approximate the feeling of an in-person meeting. So at, at, a, at a minimum, you're going to want to make sure that you have agreed in advance on the, on the best available setup, IT setup for each of the, for each witness location, 
you may agree in advance that witnesses will, if, if possible, will, will travel to someplace like the virtual hearing suite that Eric just discussed that the HKIC has very helpfully set up in Hong Kong. Uh, that's kind of an ideal solution, it, but if that's not possible or it's not possible for the witness to travel to some other uh, hearing or conference location and they're just going to be appearing at home, then it's necessary to make sure that you have the right IT set up for that witness in that location. You, you want to make sure that there is a fast and stable wired internet connection. You want to make sure that you have, you're, you're doing the best that you can with your camera positioning and your lighting. So we had one case in which the, the witness was viewing the hearing on a very large television monitor. And uh, the moment that the cross-examiner appeared on, on the screen, the witness almost jumped out of his seat and said, can you please step back away from the camera? Your face is too large. So that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to try to figure out in advance to make sure that you have that camera positioning both on the part of the witness and also on the part of the examiner so that it's comfortable not intimidating uh, and not too difficult to maintain that kind of an eye-to-eye uh, um, uh, -eye connection between, between the two. Microphones, you want to make sure that you're using uh, a, a stable, reliable uh, microphone. It could be a standalone microphone. It could be a headset that, like I'm using. Some people don't like the look or feel of wearing the headset, but uh, I find it to be a very reliable solution, particularly a wired headset. The wired headset never never fails. It's much better than a wireless headset in that respect. Uh, it's more important than even then in an, in an in-person hearing to avoid uh, crosstalk to the extent that you can. That'll work to the benefit of the, the, the hearing reporter, the court reporter. Uh, and finally, adjust your expectations in your time management plan. So you want to sort of go into the virtual cross-examination knowing that there may be some IT issues that arise. It may be difficult to develop a rapport. Maybe you want to kind of uh, adjust accordingly. So think about what are the really important objectives that, that you really need to achieve and you know how are you going to manage your time? So let's go to the next slide, please. So this this slide addresses the question of how, how do you ensure that each witness has full and immediate access to all the documents that will be used in the cross-examination. Now, it, it's important to mention here at the outset that even in an in-person hearing, there are different approaches to putting documents in front of the witness. Different lawyers, different examiners have different preferences and styles. So I've always been of the view that it is fair and helpful to the witness for the witness to have a hard copy version of the documents that he or she is being asked to review because that allows the witness to skim through the document at the outset of the questioning. It allows the witness to flip back and forth between earlier and later pages in the document during the examination. Uh, and if there are multiple language versions of the document, it allows the witness to easily have both language versions side by side in front of them. So in, in, per, in the in-person hearing context, I have always preferred preparing a cross-examination bundle, which is a tabbed binder of, doc, of all the documents that I anticipate using in the cross-examination uh, and putting that in front of the witness and then directing the witness to simply turn to tab three, turn to tab five. I've found that to be the, the most efficient and most direct way to to move from one document to the next and avoid dead time or wasted hearing time. Uh, as, as all of you know, hearing time is a precious and finite commodity. So you never want to be wasting it, scrambling, looking for, for documents. There are other ways of putting documents in front of the witness, but that's the, the, the method that I tend to prefer. And if we had more time, we could talk about the various different pros and cons. So how do you do this in the context of a remote or virtual cross-examination? So there are a variety of potential solutions. Again, I think the ideal solution would be to have a member of the examining counsel's team uh, hand deliver the, cross the hard copy cross-examination bundle to the witness at the outset of the examination. But 
you know, that's only going to be possible if, you know, the, your, the pandemic circumstances allow. And, it, you know, there's, there may be circumstances where it, it isn't practical or cost effective to have someone go out and do that. So another, another option is to simply courier the, the hard copy bundle to the witness in advance or to opposing counsel in advance. But uh, oftentimes counsel are concerned that doing that would give an unfair advantage to the witness or to opposing counsel if they have the opportunity to begin reviewing and studying the documents in advance of the cross-examination and beginning to anticipate what the questions may be. So one method that has been adopted has been to uh, put that hard copy bundle in a sealed envelope and you agree in advance that it, it, you'll, be, you'll deliver it and then the witness will break the seal on camera at the outset of the examination. Now, if it isn't as important to you to for there to be physical hard, you know, hard copy documents in front of the witness, another alternative, which also can work and has worked in some of our hearings, is to in advance give the witness local electronic access, like on a USB drive, to all of the exhibits in the case, so the full case record, and it clearly organized in a in a very clear and easily accessible folder structure, and in the course of the examination, you ask the witness to turn to exhibit you know, C5, and they will just click and open up the electronic, local electronic copy of that document. They have full control. They can scroll up and down in the PDF of the document. It's not quite the same as being able to flip back and forth in a hard copy, but it, it's an acceptable alternative. Now, all of that is in addition to using an evidence presenter, which I strongly recommend, to display the particular excerpts of the documents that are being asked about in the cross-examination so that all of the participants can follow along. Now, if we could turn to the next slide and we'll move quickly because I think I've, I'm, I'm at the end of my 15 minutes. So there's a concern, of course, about IT issues that may arise at the witness site. And of course, the problem of the technology challenged witness. We're all familiar with the phrase, you're on mute uh, from, from all of our, our Zoom meetings over time. Uh, it should be the responsibility of the presenting parties counsel to make sure that each of that party's witnesses has the proper IT setup and understands how to use it. Uh, in the pre-hearing IT test, there should be a, a separate pre-hearing IT test for each witness site or involving each witness site. And it'd be great to, in, to have the witness actually participate in that IT test. Uh, that's a nice opportunity for the witness to get some familiarity with how the virtual hearing is going to run, uh, what it's going to look like, how the, how the technology works. And from the perspective of the presenting party, it may relieve some of the pre-hearing anxiety for, uh, for your witnesses to do that. To the extent that you can have someone in person at the witness site assisting with any IT issues that may arise, that is obviously ideal. And again, as Eric mentioned, very important to have some sort of a backup plan in case the IT issues become unmanageable. Uh, if we could move to the, the final slide. Uh, the role of professional counsel in, in all of this really is key. Uh, it's important for the lawyers to actually understand or be proficient in the technology. So even the most technology adverse lawyers need to learn the technology so that they can fully participate in these hearings. Uh, counsel should be conferring and seeking to agree on a clear virtual hearing protocol uh, and then having the tribunal resolve any disputed issues well in advance of the hearing. And that kind of cooperation between counsel really can go a long way towards mitigating the logistical challenges of virtual cross-examination. And as I've said here, virtual hearings are not a blood sport. They don't, they don't need to be. So that's my, my plug on my mission to, to, uh, to civilize with respect to virtual hearings. And uh, thank you again very much to HKIC for the invitation to uh, participate in this webinar. Thank you, Anton, for your very informative presentation. I really liked your nanny cam idea. I'll keep that in mind. Um, next up, uh, we have the EPIC team here to demonstrate the use of evidence presentation and transcription services. Patrick is the operation director overseeing the court reporting and transcription services in Asia. Rajay is the operations manager specializing in providing end-to-end -end support for transcription services. And Kate is the business op uh, director 
uh, responsible for advising clients of all um, aspects of court reporting and transcription related services in Asia. So I turn it over to you, Epic. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. And welcome again. And uh, now that we have heard some um, excellent over overview of virtual hearing and also some insightful tips about cross-examination and some potential uh, pitfalls and uh, solutions of cross-examination, I think that this is a natural progression to the uh, webinar for the webinar, uh, webinar that uh, we can show you the live demonstration of a virtual hearing. How does it uh, how does it work out? How does it how does it work in action? Because of the uh, global situation, I'm sure that everyone is, uh, has engaged themselves into some kind of a Zoom meeting uh, with your friends and family, or a Zoom meeting, an online meeting with your uh, with your company, or something like that. But virtual virtual hearing is a little bit different than a casual meeting online. And uh, as Eric has pointed out before, I'd like to reiterate that there's at least three components of virtual hearings. And uh, they are video conferencing, the second is uh, real-time transcript, and the third thing is uh, electronic presentation of evidence. And I'm not going to pass the time to uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Raji and Kate, they're gonna give you a live demonstration of a virtual hearing. I'm gonna pass the time to uh, Raji and Kate now. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, as Patrick and Eric mentioned earlier, three of the main components for a virtual hearing is the real-time transcription, video conferencing, and uh, presentation of evidence. Uh, let's start with the uh, real-time transcription first. What do we need as a service provider? We need a list of names and email addresses of all the participants who require uh, access to the real-time feed. Once we have that, we will send an email to all these recipients. They will receive a unique link in order to access the real-time feed. All you need to do is just click on the link. It will open up an internet browser and it will load the, the real-time feed for you. Uh, as I share my screen right now, uh, Kelly, if you could just allow me to share my screen. So as you can see on your screen right now, this is a live feed of our session today. Uh, our court reporter who has dialed in from Japan, uh, who is kindly assist was kindly assisting us for this demo. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, she is able to provide a live feed of what I'm saying uh, on your screen. This is exactly what you would see if it was a normal he uh, hearing, uh, virtual hearing. I am now going to ask our operator to open up the index page of our document. And while he does this, uh, you can see that I can resize the window so that I can have my real time feed as well as the document uh, visual, uh, visible side by side so that you can have, uh, you can have the uh, view of both of them simultaneously. What you will see on your screen right now is the video panel would have shifted either to the right hand side or to the top of your screen. These are the default settings for Zoom, depending on how you set up your laptop. I am now going to pass it over to Kate, who is going to talk about uh, documents and bundles in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Raji. Um, as Roger mentioned, we can also display the documents. What you should be able to see on your screen just now is an index to a bundle. Um, for the sake of today, we have created a small mini bundle, which should look familiar in its format in terms of the tabs, the document description, and the page numbers. Obviously, bundles come in all shapes and sizes and far more complex but traditionally they are developed in terms of sections. So bundle A, bundle B, bundle C, and that's what we've done today. So the benefit of having a simple bundle, familiar bundle format is that it's easy to navigate. And in terms of um, contrasting the PowerPoints, which you've seen already today, the advantage of having an electronic bundle is that you can jump from different section depending on what you want to pull up. 
and having an operator to, to do so. So you can see that I've got quite a number of sections. We're not going to run through everything. We're just going to select a few. So I'm now going to ask our operator to turn to tab A4. If you could jump to that, please. So you'll see that he clicked on a hyperlink A4 and it pulls up the document that I want to talk about now. So we're looking at documents. Now this is prior to, Prior to the hearing, right at the outset, what are your considerations in terms of your documents, the bundle structure, and so on? It might depend on the volume of documents, how frequently they need to be updated, the types of documents, so how complex are they? Are they going to be large architectural drawings? Are there Excel formats? Are there videos, audio? How can they be displayed? Also, are people more comfortable using hard copies, in which case then hard copy document format, bundle format, can be replicated in electronic format as well. Are there going to be some documents which need to be uh, kept confidential um, from some of the witnesses? That's something that you can discuss beforehand with the service provider, with the operator, to ensure that certain documents are not shown and how the screens are going to be shared. At this point, I'm going to ask the operator to navigate to A5. So this brings us on to bundles. So you can see the little diagrams at the bottom. There's the nice familiar lever arch files that everybody is uh, familiar with. And there are now electronic documents as well. Fundamentally, they form exactly the same purpose. It's just the delivery method that's different. So there are two main types of electronic bundles that you might hear of. One is an offline electronic bundle and one is an online electronic bundle. Both of them can be used in a virtual hearing. The difference is that an offline electronic bundle means that it's provided to the users in advance of the hearing, either via a downloadable link or on a USB. An online electronic bundle means that all users can log in, and there's also the advantage of collaboration in advance if necessary. But the functionality of the two allow for searching, annotating, zooming, tagging, and so on. So, the functionality is the same, but it depends on where your comfort level is, where your technology knowledge is, um, as to what you prefer. What you'll also notice near the top of this page is a highlighted blue link. That is an internal hyperlink. So this is useful, for example, for opening submissions where an the ease of navigation between a certain document and exhibits from witness statements. It's a matter of simply clicking on a link rather than going back to the index and navigating that way. So if I can ask the operator to click on the hyperlink, that takes me through to my next document. So now to talk about the in the hearing, what you're seeing at the moment is EPE, Electronic Presentation of Evidence. We're working at the moment with an, with an offline bundle, so the structure is very simple. But there are some functionalities that are available, um, depending on what the documents require and the need of um, your presentation. So I could ask the operator, for example, to rotate this document. So that's obviously useful for landscape drawings or to zoom in if perhaps there's a document that you want to pay particular attention to a specific paragraph or there are some other advanced functionality depending on the platform that you use. You can highlight and you can prepare in advance. It's worthwhile considering the documents that you've got and what do you want to present? Do you want to discuss in advance with the operator some specific functionality that you will need in terms of zooming in or opening specific cells on Excel documents, for example, as well? 
So at this point, I'm going to ask my colleague Raji to jump back in again, but I'm going to also ask if the operator could quickly pull up document A2, and Raji's going to talk about choice platform and other preparation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kate. Um, so many of you would probably see very familiar names here. Um, no matter what platform you choose to uh, for your virtual hearing, the important thing to remember is all of them have many similar functionalities. From our experience, uh, Zoom, but sometimes WebEx as well, are the most common uh, platforms to be used for virtual hearings, probably because of their user-friendly interference interface. From our experience, uh, the common functionalities that are available on these platforms are waiting rooms, where the moderator has control over who to grant access to the main hearing, or even do a quick checklist to see if that uh, participant is supposed to be admitted into the room. There are uh, functionalities of breakout rooms where each party or the tribunal members can split into separate virtual hearing rooms to discuss in private during break time. Uh, the waiting rooms are also available so that when the witnesses are waiting to be cross-examined or during break time, that is where they need to wait into. Other functionalities for these platforms are mute and unmute button, the video on and off button, uh, raise hand functionality, uh, the speaker and gallery view, just to name a few of these functions available on these platforms. Speak to, your, uh, speak to your service provider if you need any assistance and they will be able to guide you on how to move forward with these platforms. Now, if I could ask my op uh, the operator to go into tab B3. So as you can see from this diagram, uh, it really depends on what equ equipment is available to you. You can obviously, it is possible to use just one laptop to be able to view the real-time feed, the document, and the VC. However, you might find that a little bit of uh, too congested if you have to sit for a long hearing day. Uh, our recommendation is a minimum of two screens. So you could have one laptop, which is running the real-time feed, as well as the video panel, and then a connected monitor, which would expand into showing the document for better visual, uh, visuals. Alternatively, you could also use three separate screens so that each window can open up separately. Uh, this is quite ideal for, um, from our experience, especially for the arbitrators, as hearings could run really long and they don't want to uh, be looking at one tiny screen for, uh, for a long day. <clears throat> if you need assistance with any of the uh, any equipment, if you have a local service provider, please reach out to them and they would be able to help you to supply some of these equipment. Other items that you should prepare for your virtual hearing is uh, a, proper, a proper pair of headsets with a mic to ensure that the quality of the audio is loud and clear, for, uh, especially for the main speakers, as you need to ensure that the, the record of the transcript is accurate and as well as it's better for the, speak, uh, the uh, participants during the hearing. You also need to ensure that you've got a stable internet connection. Uh, we recommend obviously a LAN cable instead of a Wi-Fi, uh, but if this is not readily available, uh, ensure that your Wi-Fi is strong enough in order to avoid any distractions or disruptions or lagging or disconnections. Uh, you may also want to consider your environment. Uh, you pick a room probably where there's enough lighting so that the quality of the video is uh, good for uh, all the viewers, as well as uh, you know there's less disruptions where people are moving around, uh, and also to ensure that there's no echo in the room because that would affect the quality of the audio uh, during the hearing. Uh, we recommend to, uh, obviously, once you have chosen your platform um, and, and have set up all the necessary equipment, 
organize a test session with your service provider so that they can test with you the audio, the video, as well as the internet connectivity and uh, you know the equipment setup on how what is best for you for the duration of the hearing. Uh, the other thing, if the test sessions also help you to ensure that you're familiar with the platform, their functionality, so that the hearing can run as smoothly as possible. Uh, on a final note, uh, one other item that we uh, have been assisting for virtual hearings is the interpretation. I'm now going to hand it over to Tiffany, who's going to get into more details about this service. Thank you. Thank you, Epic team, for your um, insightful presentation. A live demonstration is always really helpful to put everything in perspective. Um, lastly, um, as we have, we have Tiffany and Tom from TransPerfect to provide uh, an explanation on simultaneous and consecutive uh, interpretation. They will be also providing a live demonstration of the simultaneous inter interpretation services. Tiffany oversees TransPerfect uh, conference services team in APAC region, working across multiple verticals to facilitate in-person conferences and right now remote solutions and multiple uh, modes of interpretation. Tom is the legal expert at TransPerfect. Um, during this part of the presentation, we, uh, which is conducted in English, of course, we have the option to turn on the S, uh, simultaneous interpretation uh, translation so you get a glimpse of how it sounds and it's conducted. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see on the tab, um, control tab, uh, tab at the bottom, the a globe icon and uh, which says interpretation. So if you click on that, you have options to um, click on Chinese Mandarin or Korean. Um, my apologies, these are the two only translations we have available today, but um, you can turn this option, um, click on Chinese or Korean on and off throughout this part of the presentation. So you can see what it sounds like and um, have an experience. Now I turn it over to you, Chance Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, hello, everyone that's dialed in today. Um, and thanks to HKIC, our fellow panelists, and for everyone else that have taken their time to dial in today. Um, before we start our session, as Kelly was mentioning, um, we do have these two linguists available and on the line. So please feel free to use them. Um, as Kelly's mentioned, you just click that globe icon. And if you'd like to, um, you can hear both the English running in track with the translation at the same time, you'll notice my audio is silenced. Um, and then when the interpreter stops, my speech will come back up to full volume again. So that gives you the Zoom background in terms of flow. So as Kelly's already briefly introduced, um, my name's Tom. I'm an account executive at TransPerfect Legal Solutions. So I work with clients across our full legal technology services offerings. So we cover digital forensics, document management, e-discovery, and other service lines. And I also spend a lot of my time working with um, our full language services offerings as well. So I support legal and compliance professionals with transcription after the fact, document translation, and the main topic of this segment, so interpretation services. Um, Tiffany is here from our conference services team, and here she is. Hi, I'm Tiffany, and I work within our conference services division. We provide experience for particular specific linguists tailored for particular events, ranging from large conferences with thousands of attendees to small and discrete hearings. Our interpreters today are Jiwon, who is a professional Korean interpreter, as well as Scott, who is a professional Mandarin interpreter. So the rundown for today, we're going to give an overview of the different interpretation modes, the associated benefits and potential drawbacks, remote and hybrid solutions, as well as some example setups and best practices. Okay. so. In international arbitration, it's highly likely that um, a common language has been selected for the proceedings that both parties can understand, as well as the arbitrator or arbitrators. Um, that is exactly the same when it comes to a virtual hearing and is no different as soon as we take things online. So the most common reason interpretation is required is to support witnesses, experts, or individuals that are unable to address the tribunal in that established tongue. 
Um, there are, of course, many other reasons why an interpreter might be preferred, um, even if an individual is bilingual. Um, some of these can be partially tactical in that it gives your witness a bit more time to think about responding, responding, <laughs> responding. Um, and it can also force them to pause before and consider their answers. Um, so this can be a benefit for um, parties when they're conducting a hearing, um, as well as simply giving them the familiarity of speaking in their more comfortable tongue. Ultimately, our interpreters are in place to ensure that effective oral testimony is provided, although they can assist as well with documents. So as you've seen before, there's means to present documents um, within a virtual platform, and our linguists can also assist with um, reviewing and interpreting um, orally what they see on a page, such that a witness can understand um, what is being referenced on a document. Um, we do see rare occasions where, especially in this region, um, parties speak an established language, but an arbitrator may not. Um, this has been a slightly more commonplace in the PRC, whereby um, both parties speak um, Mandarin Chinese, but the arbitrator is an English native speaker. Um, this is a less common occurrence, but it is something that we can accommodate as well. So in most circumstances, both traditionally and typically virtually as well, um, a consecutive interpretation is set up. So this is effectively what we have on the slide. So we have one party speak. Um, this is directed towards the interpreter. They will translate or interpret for the expert or the witness and then vice versa. So they'll respond in their native tongue and back to the wider tribunal. Um, so we'll move on to our next slide. And the main thing here really is for parties to decide between consecutive or simultaneous interpretation. So consecutive interpretation is the mode that most attendees on this call would be most familiar with. So an individual will say a sentence, the interpreter parrots the sentence for the audience to understand before relaying back the response. The interpreters, well, this fosters the highest rate of accuracy as the sentences are shorter and there's more time for the interpreters to process the contents. A single interpreter can handle this for a full day without any additional support, meaning that in terms of cost of language resources, this is the cheapest mode of interpretation. And simultaneous interpretation is commonly referred to as the UN style interpretation, as parties are sat with headsets listening to audio feed interpretations real time. And this is typically used for large meetings or events. But with virtual hearings becoming more and more prominent, coupled with the ease of arranging a simple remote setup without the need for additional technology or equipment like microphones or receivers that you typically see at an on-site event, simultaneous interpretation is a realistic solution for virtual hearings. The accuracy, however, is considered to be lower than consecutive simply due to the immediate feedback of the interpreted content or in relation to consecutive, there's less time for processing. It's pretty intense for a linguist, so not to mention the differences in syntax, sentence structures, and everything else that comes with, you know, interpreting between languages. So we always use two linguists for this, and they rotate on and off, so it'll give them time to let their brain to recuperate. So when we're talking about cost differences um, in these, obviously, we are speaking about the cost of interpretation fees themselves, so the resources that are supporting you in the room or virtually. Um, it's important that counsel and end clients are considering the mode of interpretation as this can have wide implications to the fees associated to the arbitration. That, may, that mainly being because if you're proceeding under a consecutive interpretation outline, the overall duration of the arbitration is likely going to be longer because of you're going to have more time with lawyers, experts, arbitrators, having a back and forth discussion via an intermediary and that can reflect in increased respective hourly fees. So that's kind of like a background thing to consider as well when selecting your mode of interpretation. Um, and in those circumstances, clients may prefer to double down and follow a simultaneous interpretation route instead, whereby you have two linguists and everything flowing in a much more real time perspective. <coughs> So both of these modes can be deployed in within a remote interpretation setup, depending on the client and the council's preference. As a service provider, we also actively play the role as a consultant. So we like to advise our clients based on their preferred platforms on helping them troubleshoot and put together a bespoke solution. So what are the benefits of remote interpretation? 
clients are given an access to an even broader pool of experienced linguists, and they're not limited to linguists that are usually in city or in country, in country. and this is a very common practice with in-person engagements. And mostly for cost-saving reasons, the client wouldn't have to pay the interpreter for travel, their hotels, and meals, and their flights, and instead, the linguists can just dial in securely and everyone benefits. As with any of the, of the parties on the line today, you know, everyone is to an extent subject to or at mercy of technology holding its end of the bargain. If the connection drops or a witness is difficult to hear, uh, our interpreters will still so try their best to accurately interpret what's being said as accurately as possible. But this is no different than an in-person meeting. And, but there's also the absence of you know, physical cues and body languages to consider. So we're also starting to see um, a need for hybrid solutions where some parties are appearing in room with uh, the witness or experts or opposing counsel and arbitration dialing in remotely. And as partial global restrictions continue to exist, there may be a continued opportunity for remote interpretation to support an international arbitration. Cool. So just like in-person hearings, um, we also have key things to consider when setting up um, interpretation both virtually as well. Um, it's really crucial that we establish a set protocol and that's commonplace across everything to do with the arbitration and interpretation should form part of that protocol. Um, we strongly encourage um, all parties to share any kind of prepared materials ahead of time and in advance such that the linguists can read through and become familiar with everything that they need to know. Um, a common kinds of documents for these are opening statements and witness statements. And this can really allow our linguists to better understand the matter and also give a, beta, a greater outline to what is going to be discussed or preempt ahead of time. So interpretation is an incredibly human and very personal service. Um, and as such, it's tailored for individuals, um, depending on people's preference. So we have clients that prefer it, the interpreter to speak in a certain voice um, that are more or less expressive um, or even that can mirror their own emotions. We've had cases where counsel's preference is, if I'm shouting, I want the interpreter to be shouting as well. They want to really take things to that next level. So we are, in, to an extent, trying to build a partnership between our interpreter and the responding um, counsel and, and the witnesses such that we can have that familiarization and bond between them. And that isn't an overnight process. We, we like to ensure that interpreters are paired up on a matter ahead of time, they have opportunities to familiarize themselves with one another and they can have these discussions ahead of time. Again, our witnesses and experts may have never used an interpreter before. So it's really crucial that ahead of time, they have an opportunity to um, have a familiarization session, whether that's just for the witness or whether that's also um, with counsel involved as well. So as people have been discussing before, technology is the key factor here, and it's something that we will have to deal with, and the interpreters are no different. Um, they will, again, be connected through reliable wired USB headsets. Um, we encourage them to have a wired internet connect connection, as well as contingency programs in place. And that's common across different arbitration centers as well, such that the phone lines and, and connections are secure. So the main thing really um, as well, when you have to consider a virtual setup is you also are accommodating across different time zones as well. So scheduling of virtual hearings can become quite a complicated matter. And um, when you're looking through these bits and pieces, you can have a scenario where you're seating in one country, whereas you have parties dialing in from two opposite sides of the globe. Um, that can be a typical difficulty when it comes to interpretation because you either are dealing with unsociable hours or you're having to pull in a resource and traditionally you'd fly them into location so that becomes more costly. We've recently been able to accommodate um, requests using, using Asian languages um, for a Paris seated arbitration um, throughout the European business day and because of the virtual hearing setup we're able to pull in a linguist from a more convenient time zone to cover off the, the need, rather than either in a traditional sense flying someone in or having someone dial in from an unsociable hour over in Asia. 
That's perfect. It's very active in serving your corporate clients' events as well. And as a result, we definitely do go out and try to familiarize ourselves with, you know, different solutions that are out there that can be a potential fit for our clients. And with that being said, our goal is to accommodate and advise our clients as much as possible so we can assist them with over the phone interpretations, as well as of a number of third party platforms. And many of these platforms you see on the screen are the most common platforms our clients come to us with. And for full visibility, most of them do not have an interpretation function built in. And as you can see, and as you're experiencing today with the webinar, Zoom actually does have an interpretation functionality built in. So this is great for webinars and ideal and arbitration setups. As one of the world's largest and leading language services providers, we have expansive resources to cover specific verticals and subject matters. Aside from assisting with arbitrations, court hearings, and depositions, we have been providing remote solutions even before COVID-19. We provided interpreters covering eight languages at the Rugby World Cup sports arbitration hearings. This is a great example of preparation makes perf perfect as we had to ensure that all interpreters were fully versed in the technical terms associated to the niche, that is the loss of rugby. Okay, so that pretty much covers everything that we have um, on interpretation. Um, one thing we have got on here are a couple of QR codes. And so if the audience wanted to connect via LinkedIn, you can just take out your phone, scan the QR code, and it will immediately take you to our respective pages and we can have a discussion there as well. Um, we'll pan back over to Kelly and the HKIC. Thanks again for everyone's time. And we'll be available for any questions as well. Just turn off the screen sharing. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Tiffany. Um, that live demonstration was really helpful um, on just being able to queue in and out of the Korean and um, Mandarin Chinese was um, a very good experience. So now we're at the very end of our um, presentation. Um, Um, and we're at the Q&A session. Um, we have a few questions for our speakers here today. Um, the first one is um, for Eric. Um, what type of pre-hearing uh, measures are taken by institutions such as HKIC to ensure smooth virtual hearings, such as IT uh, checks or training sessions available? Sure, so um, ideally before the hearing, uh, the, the testing process actually starts uh, several weeks before uh, the actual scheduled date of the hearing. Uh, we'll usually do a first run uh, test and that's just to test connectivity, uh, make sure that the parties are able to connect to the platform which they've chosen, whether that is IP based or cloud based, make sure that if there are witnesses uh, participating remotely, that those witnesses are able to um, connect and are able to be heard. A lot of that is also um, in relation to making sure that the parties are able to be heard. We've had several situations where uh, parties are trying to connect, you know, for example, multiple microphones or multiple computers to uh, the conference and that may uh, cause feedback issues. And, or they're using a, a microphone or they're in a room which is, has a lot of echo um, or a lot of ambient sound. And so the point of doing the first couple tests is to make sure that the audio and the video quality are of a high enough quality where we're confident that they can proceed with the hearing. Um, we usually will then do a sort of a, not so much a dress rehearsal, but um, sort of a, a last, uh, last minute test right before the hearing to make sure again, that the parties are able to connect uh, usually that will also include the arbitrators and all of the um, service providers and all the personnel which will be helping to support the hearing. So court reporter, um, interpreters if necessary, arbitrators, um, all connecting to the technology to make sure that, again, testing it as closely as possible to a real hearing, that it all works out. So it's not just a matter of oh, setting up one test uh, two weeks before the hearing. There, there are actually going to be multiple tests, uh, which we recommend um, just to make sure that everything is perfect when the hearing does uh, eventually happen. Uh, given the amount of time and the costs which go into organizing a hearing, um, make sure you set aside some time, um, a couple hours spent uh, on testing sessions two weeks and one week before can save you a lot of time during the actual hearing. Okay. 
Thank you, Eric. Um, the next question we have is for Anton. Um, have you had any personal experiences with a challenging witness? And um, if you could give us an um, give us your war story on that. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I, I have uh, been fortunate to have had experiences with challenging witnesses, both in, in person and uh, and virtually uh, or, uh, or through video uh, cross-examination. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation that one of the, the things that you need to do in order to ensure a smooth cross-examination is to be able to control the witness and not allow the witness to take over control of the examination uh, by, for example, refusing to directly answer questions, continuing to talk on and on and on without uh, allowing for you know, you know, the, the, the discussion to, to go flow back into the next uh, line of cross-examination questioning. Those are some, some examples. And sometimes you have witnesses who, are, who are, uh, can be a bit belligerent. My, in my experience, you know, the steps that you need to take to control that kind of a witness uh, are, are essentially the same steps, whether you're doing it in person or whether you're doing it in, uh, in a virtual setting. The one thing I will say is that uh, when you do it virtually, one of the advantages is that you have on the screen in front of you, not only the picture of the, you know, the video feed of the witness, but also the video feed of the three members of the tribunal. And so one of the one of the tricky and sensitive things in any cross examination is wanting to make sure that you're striking the right balance between controlling the witness, but doing so in a way that's that is polite enough and civil enough that it's not going to annoy the tribunal or give the tribunal the impression that you're being unfair to the witness. So in an in, in a live in person examination, that's a little bit tricky because your your line of sight in, in one direction is toward the witness. And oftentimes, you know, the tribunal members are uh, in a different direction. And you would have to be kind of it's a bit difficult to to gauging the tribunal's reaction while at the same time that you're trying to engage with the witness, control the witness, remind the witness to answer the questions, interrupt the witness rarely but when necessary to make to let them know that it's really important that they answer the questions and and so forth so but the nice thing about a virtual hearing is that you have right in front of you the tribunal members and you can see their reactions as they are happening in in real time and that can and can actually potentially make it a little bit easier to know you know, if they're also getting frustrated with the uncooperative witness, and then that's the, that's the moment when you may be in your um, best position to, to jump in and do a polite interruption of, of the witness to try to get the examination back on track. Great point. So there's actually a benefit to doing a cross-examination on the virtual hearing setting. Um, thank you, Anton. Um, another question that we have from the audience is, has anyone come across a virtual hearing where the arbitrators request for a hard copy bundle as well as an e-bundle? Um, so uh, requiring both options. Um, anyone feel free to chime in? Uh, you're on. You're not. You're on mute. I'm just. Thank you, Kate. I'm just asking our operator to unmute me. <laughs> um, Hear you. <laughs> um, that is actually a very common request. Yes, um, I think there is. Regardless of the virtual hearings, there is a comfort and a familiarity with hard copy bundles, and there's no reason to consider one versus the other because. The electronic bundle that I showed you earlier, which although it was a Kate, small, I think we lost you. I can't hear you on my. Can others hear Kate? Yeah, we can hear Kate. Can you hear me now? Can anyone hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Okay, um, so I think there is a familiarity and a comfort in terms of having a hard copy and an electronic version. The, the bundle that I showed earlier, although it was small, um, replicates exactly the bundle structure that we're used to producing when we, when we do um, hard copy versions as well as a, a matching electronic version. The advantage is 
that the tab structure and the pagination structure follows through in both versions, whether hard copy or electronic. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, it, and I've also seen in many of our cases where they do require both hard copy and e-bundle. Um, I think the preference is always to have a backup plan in case um, there are any issues with the e-bundle. Um, the last question um, due to time that I will um, address is, given the current situation and trends towards virtual hearings, do you see any chance of moving back to actual hearings? Um, I'll kick it off. I think yes, if it's possible and the restrictions of um, international travels and other means are available. I think there will always be an appetite for an actual hearing um, just because of the comfort level and uh, because of the uh, unfamiliarity with uh, virtual hearings. That said, I think the virtual hearing option will always be on the table um, and more used once people get more familiar with it and have the experience to actually conduct one. Um, I say that because People are experiencing, um, of course, there are issues, um, but there are also more benefits of virtual hearings, cost tape savings, time savings, more greener arbitration, um, and there's a lot of factors involved. And I think that the benefits are definitely outweighing the in-person hearing, but I, I don't think the in-person hearings will, um, all disappear um, due to virtual hearings. But Anton and um, Eric, would you like to chime in and give your input on that? Sure, if I can maybe just speak really quickly on that. I think um, it, it's a very good question as to you know whether or not we actually go back to actual hearings. And I think that sort of thought process, process is premised on you know the, the assumption that virtual hearings are a replacement for physical hearings, and it's not, it's an evolution. Um, it's the use and increased use of technology to help supplement and augment uh, what we already have. And so there are definitely going to be situations where you know, the parties will need to meet physically um, or they want to meet physically, but the technology will be there so that, again, as Kelly said, the option is available. Um, for parties who no longer have to fly halfway across the world for a case management conference. Um, witnesses who will only be called for you know, half an hour because the, the evidence which they're providing is, is, quite, um, is quite narrow in scope. A and situations where uh, time and cost would have been expended, uh, but don't have to be in, in relation to something which can be easily handled. So I think what we're seeing with virtual hearings is not so much a replacement, it's, it's an evolution, it's a, it's a supplemental to, uh, to the hearing process in general. Uh, Anton, I don't know if you want to. I, I, I think I agree with both uh, Kelly and Eric with both of your, your excellent observations. I, I think for many of us, we would still, all things being equal, have a preference for in-person hearings, particular for, particularly for merits hearings and in particularly for complex cases. But as, as you both have mentioned, there are some real advantages, particularly cost savings, uh, but also a number of other advantages to virtual hearings. So it's great that we now have this additional option that will continue, as, as Eric says, uh, to, uh, to, to be with us and uh, to be something that we can select as appropriate, uh, get, depending on the circumstances of the given case or the given hearing that's at, at issue. Thank you, Eric and Anton. Um, due to time, we do have more questions. One is directed directly at Anton. I will email that to you so you can reply to the questioner yourself. Um, um, thank you all for your um, for your time, and I would really like to thank our distinguished speakers for their great presentation. This was a very there has been a lot of virtual hearing um, webinars to date, but I think this has been a very unique experience, um, especially uh, thanks to Chance Perfect uh, for, for providing the simultaneous interpretation, and also to um, Epic for the live demonstration on the transcription and the e-bundle. Uh, it was a great experience. I learned something new 
today and hopefully the audience did as well. Um, so I thank you, uh, thank you to the speakers and also to the audience for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to tune in. Uh, for those of you who joined later on and missed some segments of the section, uh, the webinar is recorded and we will be putting the video up on our website for you to review. So please feel free to go on and uh, register and watch the uh, webinar uh, at your time of leisure. Uh, we also will be providing the information for our speakers um, on the website. So if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to contact them. Um, and the more questions that are coming in now, I will make sure that I pass this on to our speakers so they can um, answer to you by email. Thank you all. And um, I will adjourn here for today. Thank you.